Welcome to the Total Soccer Show and a little update on the very latest soccer transfers. Robert Lewandowski is now a Barcelona star, but the Blaugrana's finances remain bizarre. There's a plan underway with Eric Ten Hag, but will Man United fans once again be able to brag? And the ancient Premier League prophecy dictated that Kaladu Koulibaly's arrival in England would be predicted 60,000 times in 600 windows before a man named Todd finally made his move <laughs> and it's come to pass. The ancient transfer window scholars have been vindicated by Chelsea. My name's Ryan Bailey. Joining me today, we have a man who had a Europa Conference League trophy tattoo way before everybody else was doing it. Taylor Rockwell, hello. I mean, obviously, you gotta you gotta celebrate somehow. Credit to Jose Mourinho. I love that man for getting that tattoo. Yeah, so Jose Mourinho has the three European trophies he has won now uh, etched on his shoulder: the uh, Champions <laughs> League, the Europa League, and the UEFA Conference League. That's what it's called. Yes, no international Champions Cup though, Taylor. So it's really incomplete. I mean, I, first of all, I appreciate you restating what it's actually called, because if you had asked me, I probably would not have been able to say it either. There is, it really does not they. They decided early on, didn't they, that it's going to be the third tier trophy. We're going to give it a third tier name. It's none of that like yeah. League One Championship Premier League where they all kind of mean the same thing. They're really letting us know the Europa Conference League doesn't have the, the majesty of the UEFA Champions League. Not quite. Well, its majesty, Taylor, has been raised by being tattooed on that gentleman in Rome. Uh, joining I mean, us yeah. also, Taylor... Yep, yep, yep. Joining us, Taylor, a man who's melting on the hottest day in oh. UK history. It's above slightly wearing jacket weather in <laughs> Scotland, Graham Ruthven. <laughs> oh, it's so hot. And I just to just to offer an insight into how the, the sausage is made on TSS, I always record underneath a very thick bed sheet to dampen down the noise. And most of that time, it's fine. It's Scotland. It doesn't get too warm today. However, it's the hottest day in British history. And this bed sheet might actually suffocate me by the time we're done here. Even if I ever survive, it's, it's, it's going to be swampy, shall we say, by the end of this podcast. Yeah, Graham, uh, shortly before we recorded, listener, Graham sent us a picture of the temperature currently in Scotland. It is 29 degrees, which is 84 Fahrenheit. Graham. Hottest day in history, Ryan. <laughs> Goodness me. Well, yeah, so it, it's it's going to be up to about 36 where I am. I'm also in England at the moment, which is sort of approaching 100, which is kind of an average to summer day in the US. Or as our other host, Joe Lowry, calls it, a let's put on long sleeves day because it's slightly <laughs> chilly in Phoenix. Hello, Joe. I'm I'm just trying to find it in my heart to give you some sympathy, Graham, for not knowing how to build an air conditioning unit. Not just you, but your your entire people, your entire land. Um, you really could have thought ahead a little bit about this and That's tried true. to, as as a society, try to get some AC involved. But I guess it's not really your fault. Uh, as it? soon as this is over, I'm going to start work on an air conditioned bed sheet for for uh, recording the Do podcast it. tomorrow. <laughs> um, I Excellent. watched it, Graham. I learned something for when you don't have air conditioning from the Great Gatsby movie, where they had a, a fan and a okay. bucket of ice in front of it. That's like you could do that. What else did you learn from that movie? Um. Gatsby was New mysterious. <laughs> New money's got no class, baby. That's what we learned from the great Gatsby. And also yes. Daisy is the worst book character in yes. American literature. Yeah. Yeah. We did learn that. Oh, yeah. But we Baz did. knows how to do a movie. That's what we know, right, T? Oh, of course. Of course. You, I, I, I still want to see the Elvis movie. I have not seen it yet, but I have heard good things. Uh, I don't know if those things are correct, but that's what I've heard. There you go, Graham. You could go and sit in a movie theater and watch a Baz yeah. Luhrmann movie for three hours. And that'd be some aircon in there, right? Mm, no thanks no still not Graham, for me Graham, I, other I people mean will this... be there right <laughs> yeah oh that's true it. that's true Graham, my my advice which which is probably not going to be helpful but i do mean uh in turkey it was like the humidity would always get me when it was really really hot because if you're like riding public transport it's going to be even hotter and i did find that when i was annoyed by how hot it was when i was like oh, i better not sweat i've got to go teach like i don't want to be covered in sweat i sweat more and i get and i felt hotter i think because i was fighting it if you just lean into the like yep i'm recording in so, like tropical embrace climate. the sweat yeah, yeah em embrace it and then it doesn't annoy you as much drip yeah. i mean i mean i'm drip. recording shirtless it's just as well this as an uh <laughs> skype call or a zoom call <laughs> i mean it's oh, a get it why of course you're recording shirtless that's how it works <laughs> <laughs> and he's got so many shirts. It's the irony, Taylor. It's the irony. Um, why don't we talk about some transfers then today? Why don't we start off in the most mysterious of clubs at the moment, or perhaps the most puzzling of clubs, Barcelona. 
Um, okay, so Taylor, they've signed Rafinha for 58 million euros. We learned mm-hmm. recently they've signed Robert Lewandowski for 45 million euros. They've signed Pablo Torre for 5 million euros from Racing Santander. They've got um, Kessie and Christensen both in on freeze. They've only brought in, if my math is correct, 5 million euros in transfers incoming. Uh, they, their transfer dealings for Frankie de Jong are being held up because of deferred wages during the pandemic. So they are spending many millions of euros while still mm. owing their current squad money. They've got new players not registered yet. They are uh, currently breaching Spain's equivalent of financial fair play. They are mortgaging against their future earnings with their legal t- TV rights and now apparently their merchandising deals as well, according to Marca. Taylor, what is going on? I mean, they're killing it. That's what's going on. They're figuring all this out, baby. Uh, what I imagine yeah, is the all these... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. They're literally killing it. I'm picturing uh, like the the Dumb and Dumber approach of they're giving all these clubs briefcases full of cash, and when those briefcases are uh, open later on, they're just full of actually written out IOUs and not actual cash. <laughs> That's probably one way you can get around doing some deals. But it does seem like I think... Uh, There's a great report by the Swiss Ramble that I read just before recording that filled in some of the blanks where I've been confused. And I think to start, it does seem like some of the reporting uh, is a little bit exaggerated because you get the big one would be that I think the report said that they lost 555 million euros in 2021 alone, which is the highest loss ever reported by a club. But there's loan restructuring, there's salary reductions, but then there's also been... Uh, I think because of COVID relief payments, that number is, I think, significantly lower, still very high. I think it's only about 200 million euros they've lost in one year, but that is way better than like 550 million euros. So some of the reporting is a little bit confusing, but that aside... Ryan, you sort of have already explained it. They are essentially selling off their own assets. Uh, I think if you wanted to be maybe slightly more critical, the way I've seen it written is you're selling off the family silver to be able to finance and pay for some of your bills in the present. And that is basically what they're doing is they're selling commercial assets. They're selling TV rights uh, that they will. I think some of them they can then buy back at a later date, but they're essentially sacrificing potential future revenue down the line for actual revenue right now money coming in allows them to then spend because they were in breach the way they were uh i think the numbers initially were that they could only spend one dollar of every four dollars they brought in that was reduced to they could spend one dollar of every three dollars they brought in but with these deals with the kind of short-term infusion of cash the financial levers is what i think they keep calling them now Mm. that's Uh, about to be at a point where they can spend $1 for every dollar they bring in, which is probably not going to help them in the long-term finances unless they continue to restructure and figure some deals out. But I think that is how they're getting to the point where they are able to register some of these players. That said, I think there are still a few who haven't been. I don't think Rafinha has been. And I think a lot of it is going to come down to player sales because they need to get the wages off the books, but also those sales, they can keep a larger percentage of the transfer under some of these new deals, under some of these new agreements. So if they sell players, they get more money from that transfer than they normally would, and they get the wages off the books. The issue then becomes, will those players leave? And in the case of Frankie de Jong, it seems like the answer is no, because he wants his money, (laughs) because a lot of players have also taken reduced payments or deferred wages. Uh, And so I think they've got to figure out a way to get some of those names off the books to generate some transfers. And then they've got to get some of those deals restructured or sold so that they can get those wages off the books. And And this is where my confusion and concern is for Barcelona. I understand a lot of the the financial levers that they have pulled to get some short-term cash flow into the club. As you say, Taylor, they've sold some assets, TV rights, that media company. I've read that they're trying to sell some more TV rights, which would free up about uh, another 300 million euros in, in the short term. I understand all that, but... With regards to their squad, it feels like they've done it the wrong way around, where they should have got rid of the players that they need to get rid of first, even if that means maybe not getting the best deals for them. I understand that maybe they would, they, they feel they might not be in the best negotiating position if they do that, but everyone now knows Barcelona's financial uh, situation, so I'd, I'm not sure it makes much of a difference. So they needed to get rid of some players like De Jong, like Umtiti, like uh, Marilyn Pjanic, who's still, amazingly, still on their books. 
they need to um i've read that they need to some of the players some of the senior players in at that club still need to take wage cuts so they should have agreed them as well before they start signing players like Lewandowski and Rafinha and Frank Kessie and there's also this everything that i've read about Barcelona's situation seems to be that Laporta is betting on Barcelona doing well in the Champions League this season. He's, he, the logic seems to be that Laporte is trying to keep Barcelona competitive because he sees a way to get increased Champions League revenue if they go far in the competition this season. And that will be that will also help keep the club financially stable. But that just seems like an incredibly risky ploy to me where <laughs> yeah. you're counting on oh. a sporting success to secure the long-term financial security oh, of a club. I mean, that you could you could lose a match due to a dodgy penalty decision or a deflection or something like that. That's not really uh, th- that's not really a solid plan, if you ask me to count on doing well in the Champions League to get the revenue from that. I, yeah, I don't know, to be clear. I, I don't know how to run a soccer club. I do know that this isn't how you do that thing, right? I mean, that's, that's what we've arrived at with Barcelona right now. Graham, I think that is a brilliant point. You make a lot of money by doing well in the league and by doing well in the Champions League, ideally as one of the biggest not just soccer clubs, but brands in the entire world, you do not get to the point where you have to rely on a deflection or you have to rely on your new signings to mesh together perfectly in the midfield in a Champions League knockout game to actually achieve some sort of financial stability. You should be building those platforms outside the field. You you should be building on the field as well, and that's the part of soccer that I love the most. But it's pretty clear to see that this club has been just horribly mismanaged to the point where it's not... I, I read parts of that Swiss Ramble report too, Taylor. I, I guess I feel like this, the silver analogy isn't perfect, but it, it is a good one that's used in that Twitter mm-hmm. thread. But it's it's so much more than just silver, right? I mean, silver in, in today's society, I don't think is is really growing in value all that much from day to day, although I suppose I don't really know. I don't spend much time trying to figure out how to sell silver on eBay. But still, Joe, it, it's like... Joe, just wait yeah, till you ahead. encounter your first werewolf and then tell me that you don't think silver's important. Yeah. You're so right, Taylor. You're so right. That's <laughs> what it's welcome. super That's what important. I got for you. I mean, this is, this is selling off a really valuable asset that is mm-hmm. continuing, I'm assuming, to grow in value because it's associated with one of the biggest brands in the world. And they're mortgaging that future for now. And it's not that they won't be able to get back to that future, potentially. I think there's a very good chance that five years or so from now, Barcelona are much more stable financially. But it just doesn't feel like they're going about this in the right way. All of that said, I'm not going to lie. I'm really excited to see Rafinha and to see Lewandowski and to see Christensen and Kessier. Maybe a little less Kessier just because I don't know exactly how he fits in this team. But maybe I'm wrong. I'm really looking forward to seeing some of these players play and to seeing Xavi's first full year. I think those things could be a blast, but the finances behind it make sense in a way, but are also seemingly super unwise in another way. It's 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 strange to me, just to add another layer of confusion, it's strange to me because it seemed like Barcelona in the second half of last season had stumbled upon a pretty effective plan where they were bringing through kids, really talented kids, by the way, Pedri and Nico Gonzalez and, and Gavi and uh, Ronald Araujo, even though he's a little bit older. These are all players who are expected to be cornerstones of that Barcelona team for the next 10, 15 years. They were bringing through players like that, but they were adding experience through free transfers. And I know, Joe, before you jump in, they're not free transfers, but for the sake of using that term, ah. free transfers <laughs> and loans. And sure, they might not have won the Champions League that way, but they they were competitive. They finished second in La Liga. Maybe they would be uh, they might be competitive for La Liga with the squad that they had in the second half of last season. And would it really have been so bad to have a few fallow years to preserve the future of the club while also building the core of their next great team? Would that would that have been so bad? That seems like that seems like a pretty good plan that they had, and they now seem to have yeah. thrown that out the window to to sign these ready made superstars like Robert Lewandowski at thirty three years old. Graham, the thing that I that I think is really relevant, at least to my mind, is that we are normal people. The one, the, the four of us having this conversation, we are not Speak to yourself. Uh, millionaires or billionaires <laughs> or people who are used to having that like high profile. Uh, and that's not an excuse. That's not a defense of Barcelona. But I think there is an arrogance that you kind of have to have to be elected president of Barcelona or a club of their size. And with that comes this idea of maintaining the brand, maintaining the image. And I think you're absolutely right. 
there is definitely a world in which they could have uh, stripped them, like stripped themselves of those players, sold them on for cheap, gotten rid of a lot of the wages, really focused on redeveloping the academy and bringing through academy products. And then maybe a few years down the line, you end up with another team that is just full of academy players who know exactly how they want to play and they end up winning. But in the meantime, you have removed a lot of that the prestige, or at least of the immediate prestige that Barcelona have as this institution that you know are going to be dominant in La Liga and are always going to be attractive. And that's where I think, seen a different way, some of what they've done this summer does make sense to me. I think the analogy I would go with, again, to not be very charitable, instead of selling the silverware, it's a bit like they lost all of their money at craps and they've taken out a loan and they're going to make it up at roulette. Like they're definitely (laughs) still rolling the dice a little bit and I don't know if it will work. But in the meantime, they've brought in Rafinha, who's this very exciting player from the Premier League, and they've scouted him and they brought him in, and oh, like they're still bringing in people from the Premier League. They bring in Robert Lewandowski, who wants to leave Bayern Munich to play for Barcelona. Here's this world, like, like known around the world player who is still demanding a move to Barcelona. They bring in Frank Cassier on a free, uh, like maybe not quite at that level of like pedigree, but still an incredibly good player for a Milan team that were very, very good last season. And so I think what they're trying to do is split the difference of kind of clear the decks while also still bring in names such that we think Barcelona are still this demand or like are still this draw. And they are, they will be, they have that name, they have that history. But I think if they had sort of, gone into sell, sell, sell mode, it's really public that they are not doing well, they cannot afford things, I don't think anyone's going to want to sign for them, and I think they're in a much weaker position. So I think they're trying to navigate a very tricky position that they put themselves in as well as they can by still bringing in those names, but still trying to get some wages off the books and restructuring some deals, and I think ultimately selling some of their assets. And so at the end of the day, I think it's going to be a gamble, but I think it allows them to be more competitive than they would be otherwise. And I think the relative weakness of La Liga, I know there's going to be people who are mad about that one, but I think that factors in, that we know Madrid is always going to be good. We know Atleti are probably going to be good. But there's plenty of teams historically. Look at Valencia. They just they cannot compete financially right now. And if you have more teams that are in stronger financial positions, I think Barcelona are in a more precarious position than they're presently in. But because... It's a three-team league fairly often. Uh, I think that does give them more leeway than they might have elsewhere. Am I, am I the only one who also has footballing questions about the signings that they have made? Not just financial questions. So, Taylor, you're right. Rafinha, Lewandowski, wonderful players. Rafinha's probably going to be a superstar of the future. Lewandowski's already a superstar. But when they signed Rafinha, or when it became clear that they were going to sign mm-hmm. Rafinha... I thought to myself, okay, well, that's the Usman Dembele replacement. They've decided yeah. they're not giving Dembele a new contract. And He's then... a new right winger. And then announced Dembele <laughs> has a new contract. So then I'm thinking, okay, Dembele is going to play on the left and they're going to use Obama Yang purely as a centre forward in this team. And then they sign Robert Lewandowski, who's surely going to play as a centre forward. So... Joe, I don't know if you've got some ideas on this. Sure. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Talking about, obviously, there's going to be a lot of rotation and so so on and so forth. But I, when it comes to Xavi just picking his strongest team in the Classical or in a, cha- a big Champions League game, I'm not entirely sure how this team is going to flesh out and how, what the shape and how what the approach is going to be. I think it's still going to be that base 4-3-3 shape in defense. It's still going to be likely some fullbacks pinching in. You're going to get a lot of the same tactical things that we saw from Barcelona under Xavi last year. I would just expect that that means that Lewandowski is going to be starting up top as the number nine, and you're going to get two of those wingers playing in any given game. That could be Torres, it could be Dembele, it could be Rafinha. And then I would expect Aubameyang to basically transition into being a rotation player on that front line, which I think at this point in his career is not the worst thing. I think for Barcelona, if they didn't see Memphis Depay and Aubameyang as those first two choices in the middle, which it seems like they don't, especially since there's some reports about Depay maybe leaving the club, right, not being involved if, if they can get somebody in for him, I think we're going to see Lewandowski and Aubameyang as striker one and striker two in that order. And we're going to see the wing players just staying wide at times, cutting inside from those wide areas. But I I think it's pretty clear for the most part how this works for Barcelona. I don't know if this was, again, the most fiscally prudent way to go about doing things. But, 
I mean, do any of us really think that Lewandowski doesn't make this team better? He has to, right? I mean, he's he's still, for my money, the best nine in the world, maybe the second best if you want to put Benzema up there. And then you have Holland and Mbappe coming up sort of behind that group or as this next generation. But Lewandowski can score 25, 30 goals in any league in the world whenever he wants to. I, I feel like this signing makes a lot of sense, and I think it's valuable even as both Lewandowski and Aubameyang age, but especially Aubameyang given how reliant he is on pace I think it makes sense to try to transition him into a little bit more of a rotational 1,500 minutes a year kind of role. Yeah, everything's going to work out great at Barcelona. All good. <laughs> Nothing could go wrong it's all here. good. It's all going to be great. It's, it is fascinating. I think Taylor made the point that, you know, or a point to the effect of most businesses would cut costs in this situation. They try and reduce mm-hmm. expenditure, try and reduce their own costs to get within its acceptable parameters. But you have to, there is a, there is an element of having to keep, save face as well i suppose and and to try and attract these players i think the best analogy i can think of is that barcelona are in a hole and they're digging deeper hoping they'll find a trampoline to bounce themselves out of that hole and there's a big gamble <laughs> as to whether there's going to be a trampoline at the bottom of that they're going to dig their way to chi- they're going to dig their way to china that's how they're going to get out of the hole they're just going to go all the way to the other side that's the plan yeah. perfect that that is a gamble i don't know how many holes you have dug ryan but i've never found the trampoline at the bottom of any of the holes that i've dug i'm sure there's some ancient roman trampolines in my backyard in italy i'm quite <laughs> sure of it we, we'll, we'll find out actually another analogy to use taylor would be i'm, I'm nearing the end of sopranos and when mm. sort of the the characters do deals between one another it'll be i'll lend you this but i'm taking points off your next deal oh, so yeah. it's like, it kind of feels like the, the Barcelona are going to like La Liga's TV rights and saying lend us this but you know we'll give you 49 points and for the next 10 years basically um yeah it doesn't yeah. seem financially prudent so I was gonna say one one thing that is happening that Laporta is doing that I think he deserves I don't know if he deserves credit for it but it could it could um it could benefit Barcelona over the next few years as he is doing a lot of work to try and change the wage structure. So if you look at what Lewandowski is going to be earning, I think he's going to be earning 9 million euros a year, which look, that's a lot of money. That's, that's, that's Toronto a FC money. money right there. Come on. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Joe, kind of like that analogy is, is fair enough. At Barcelona, we're paying three times that for players. I think Messi would have been on something like five times that. So they are through the 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 wage def- the deferring the wages and asking players to take pay cuts. But even in the in the players that they are signing, they are they aren't handing out as as big a wage packets. They're kind of relying on players wanting to play for Barcelona. Like Lewandowski has kind of forced this move, and as a result, he's taken less of a pay packet. So in the next few years, that that might benefit Barcelona. We it's shall it's see. wild to me that we're talking about Barcelona in this context. Of I think so far we've refer to them as like selling off silverware. Ryan's made a mafia connection. I've gone for like a desperation gambler. I don't think that's necessarily the descriptions you want when you're a football club. But if you remove everything that we've talked about and just look at that squad for a second, it is still, Graham, I hear your points about some of the tactics and how it's going to blend. But ultimately, it's just a really good team still. Like that attacking lineup, you could have Ansu Fati starting a game. You could have Ferran Torres starting a game out wide, or it could be Dembele or Rafinha. There's Aubameyang in the middle. There's Lewandowski in the middle. The uh, midfield options are strengthened. And then you have those academy players coming through. There's just, there's a lot of talent in that team. They're still very, very good. And I think will continue to be good. They definitely still need to clear out a couple more. And if I'm Manchester United, maybe, maybe I have a cheeky bid for Memphis and bring him back now that they need maybe another forward. Uh, We'll talk about them later on, I'm guessing. Uh, But I still think it's a strong Barca team. It's just the situation around that team is so bizarre and confusing at the same time that it makes them, I think, ultimately, to the original point of this conversation, a fascinating team to keep an eye on both for the rest of the offseason and then for the start of the season. Did anyone see the video of Lewandowski meeting his new teammates in the Barcelona canteen? (laughs) And the handshake with De Jong is just so cold, so cold, barely any eye contact. You'll be gone by morning, Frankie. (laughs) (laughs) On that note, we've gone long on Barcelona. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about Bayern's life after Lewandowski and Man United and much, much more back shortly. Hello, everyone. This is Taylor from the Total Soccer Show, and I wanted to let you know that today's episode is brought to you by a tool that we use on pretty much every single episode. It's FotMob. FotMob makes it super easy to follow your favorite teams, players, and leagues and get useful information like starting lineups, previous formations, and plenty of other in-depth match statistics and analysis. 
But wait, there's more. FOTMOB can be used throughout a given competition to stay updated on the latest scores, news, transfer updates, fantasy scoring, and more. And if you're tired of having to check 20 different streaming services to figure out where exactly a game is being broadcast, then you can simplify down to just FOTMOB, where you can find comprehensive TV listings for leagues around the world. The same goes for major international competitions like the World Cup, but also for, say, CONCACAF Olympic qualifying or the Women's Euros this summer. My favorite feature is that you can go into match reports and get detailed individual stats, which help do a great job of squaring the analytical side of the game with the eye test side of the game. With over 10 million active users, FOTMOB, F-O-T-M-O-B, is the place to go for all your soccer needs. Check out their website or download the app for even easier access. Get FOTMOB today, and fair warning, you will probably get sucked into their wormhole of historical lineups and historical stats. It's a great way to kill a nerdy soccer hour. Thank you to FOTMOB for sponsoring today's episode. Total Soccer Show, welcome back. Let's talk, gents, about Bayern Munich. Um, how are they going to look, Joe, without Robert Lewandowski in their ranks? Of course, they have Sadio Mane on the books now. Is he, is he a number nine replacement? Um, what do we think there? Yes, I have similar questions about Bayern Munich right now, Ryan Bailey. This is not something that for the longest time I could really envision happening. Robert Lewandowski moving, he's become so synonymous with Bayern Munich over the years. And they have other players that can do that job. But the player I keep coming back to, and we talked a little bit about this earlier this summer, is Sadio Mane continuing the the move that he made at Liverpool from left wing into that number nine spot and doing it for Bayern. I don't know exactly what that looks like. I don't know if he truly will be the every game starter for Bayern Munich up top. But when I look at their squad, he seems like the most likely candidate to do that job. Bayern Munich in general, I think, are an interesting team right now. They're making some moves. They signed good players already this offseason. I think they made some really good moves, getting Mane for relatively low fee, although as he's aging, I think there's some value behind that. you got Ryan Gravenberg and Maserawi from Ajax, who I think are, are both brilliant players. They... Gravenberg in particular needs a little more seasoning, and I think he'll have a chance to get that with Bayern Munich in the Bundesliga. But I expect him to play a good chunk of minutes this season, and Maserabi as well, I think is a brilliant fullback. Those are all strong signings, and now you add Delict to that group as well. And I think there's a lot of potential here for Bayern to be a dangerous team, as they always are. Delict helps fill a pretty obvious gap in the back. You don't have Nicolas Sula in this squad anymore. So they did need someone else, I think, to fill out that spot. And I think De Ligt will be much better at, at Bayern Munich than he was, or at least more consistent and effective than he was at Bayern Munich than he was at Juve, just because of the culture and the quality in the club and, and the, the consistency really around him. But that attack is still a, a little bit of a question mark. Are we going to see the 4-2-3-1 again? Is it going to be more of that, that really aggressive 3-4-3? Alfonso Davies is, is going to be back and healthy, so that changes things a little bit from what we saw for stretches last season. I don't know exactly what this Julian Nagelsmann team is going to look like. And for me, that's, that's kind of fun because we do see and we have seen the same, even as coaches come and go, basically the same approach and the same players on the field for Bayern Munich a lot over the last half decade. And now it feels like we might get some variety. And, and I kind of like that. I don't know if Bayern Munich really appreciates that, but I think as a neutral, expecting and, and hoping to see some different things from this team, this could be the year where we actually do see some of that change. Graham, to talk a bit about Matthias De Ligt, um, as we record, a verbal agreement has been settled reportedly between uh, between Juventus and Bayern for 80 million at 70 plus 10 million in add-ons in euros. That is, uh, that would e- if it if it does go 80, that would equal Bayern's transfer record for Luca Hernandez. I don't quite understand how he's managed to maintain his value, Graham. Yeah. Having played 117 times for Juve, I'm surprised he played that much because it doesn't seem like he completely settled in Italy. I have a lot of conflicting thoughts on De Ligt because while there's no doubting his potential, he didn't quite make the impact at Juventus that he thought I thought he would. So three years ago, when he moved to Juventus, every single elite level European club wanted Matthias De Ligt. He was seen as very much the the next great centre back, having done so well for Ajax. It was slightly surprising to me that he went to Juventus in the first place because it seemed like. Manchester City or Real Madrid or Chelsea or Manchester United of one of these clubs were, were going to sign him. But you're right, he he did have some trouble at Juventus and it is a little bit strange that after three years, so he went to Juventus, I read, for 75 million euros 
if he um, if if the the add-ons are uh, sanctioned for this deal to to Bayern Munich, that's going to take that total deal to eighty five million. So it's strange that he is now older. He's had three slightly difficult years in Italy, and now his transfer value has gone up. But I think some of the trouble that he had in, in Italy was down to the way that Juventus played. So Bonucci has primarily been the defender that Juventus have used to play out from the back. So. That's Delicht's uh, his greatest strength is, is in possession. So his he wasn't allowed to really play the way that he would like to play. I think he has improved as a natural defender under Allegri in particular. I, I was reading a lot of his defensive statistics in terms of aerial duels and just very binary things like shot shots blocked. He's he has been improving season on season. So I think if he now goes into a team where he will be expected to have a lot of the ball, like Nagelsmann's uh, Nagelsmann's Bayern Munich, there is a good chance that he will look back at the three years at Juventus as a period where he he became a more rounded player. And I think that's what Bayern Munich are counting on, is that the player that they're going to get now in their system with the way that Nagelsmann is going to use him is going to be a better player than we have seen at Juventus over the last three years. Hmm. Here's to hoping. Big T, do you want to talk about United or anything more to say about Ben Minchin? Uh, just that I, I think uh, Delict was is a very smart signing for Bayern, and I think Bayern Munich will once again be a very good team. You heard it here first. I think there's yeah. a chance they win the Bundesliga. Uh, I, I know that's Ooh. that's a, a shocker, <laughs> a shocker of a declaration, but I'm willing to make it. I think there's a chance they might. The, the strange thing about Bayern Munich is that even though they're lo- they're losing arguably their best ever player who's scored a million goals in the last mm-hmm. 10 years, I don't think this, th- this transition was always going to happen at some point. And this way they can do it on their terms with some sort of plan and with a manager who's tactically yep. strong enough to make it work. So I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing for Bayern Munich that they they are losing Lewandowski at this time. He's 33. They need they need mm-hmm. to do this at some time. And as I say, they've brought in a world-class player like Mane and they've got Nagelsmann. And so this is kind. This kind of feels like the right time to do it. I agree. All I right, think it is, it is heavily reliant. Sorry, Ryan. We're just going to keep going. I know you're trying to steal <laughs> this ship. We're going to rest it away from you every single time. We are the captain now. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I think it's it's it is interesting what will happen if Nagelsmann doesn't have a, an even stronger second season. I think he will. I think he had a good first season, and I think he's he's sort of getting the buy in from the players, and more importantly, the Bayern decision makers. But that is sort of what they're doing here: is making. The kind of narrative as I see it is players that maybe don't fit his style or don't vibe with his style are happy to to be moved on because we're embracing a younger manager. We're giving him younger players who fit his system, and this is the next evolution. There is always that concern that if you're putting all your eggs in that basket and then things don't evolve, then that narrative is kind of scuppered. But I think that is sort of the consistency that Nagelsmann has provided thus far in his career that I don't really have the concern about that the way I would if they had... I think a less established manager or less of an internationally known manager. I think that makes a big difference. So once again, we have Bayern Munich making smart decisions, but also seeming to have a strong sort of idea for how they want to move forward. I think we can't say the same of many other clubs in the world, which feels like a good way to transition to Ryan's point about Manchester United. I am happy to talk about them, but I feel like I talk about them plenty. Uh, So I would love to hear what Graham and Joe have to say about uh, current Manchester United, especially with the now official signing of Lissandro Martinez. Yeah, I'll I'll start with Lissandro Martinez. I think this is a strong signing from Manchester United. It makes sense to have the Ajax tie-in with Eric Ten Hag, who knows him very well from his time there. The, the big question around Martinez is, where is he going to play? And at this point, it seems pretty clear that he'll be a center back, at least for the majority of the time. He's the only left-footed center back, I believe, in Manchester United's squad. They have a 1,000 center backs, but all of them are, are right-footed. Martinez seems like a pretty natural fit for that left-sided center back spot. Good recruitment there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a good fit for that left-sided center back spot in the 4-2-3-1, which, to be clear, will be very flexible in possession. We're going to see different rotations. We're going to see all sorts of different stuff. That's just what Eric Ten Hag and pretty much every other manager in the world does. For me, Martinez makes a lot of sense in the back. The reason why I think there's been questions about where does he play is because Manchester United still don't have any additional depth in central midfield. That's the, the one midfield signing they've made so far is Christian Eriksen, who won't, who won't really play as a number six or a number eight. He'll be much higher, maybe even a little bit wider in the half spaces at times in that attacking line. I like this Eriksen signing, but he doesn't scratch that itch. He doesn't improve them in the 6-8 spot over Fred or over McTominay. But I, I think Martinez makes a lot of sense as a center back. I think he makes this Manchester United team better. He does not fix this Manchester United team. I think it's still going to take 
at least another couple of transfer windows, if not a little bit longer, to get this team really competing for anything meaningful in England or in Europe. But I, I do appreciate that Eric Ten Hag is slowly starting to make his mark and to bring in some of the players that he really wants and values into this team. I think that's a good and positive step, even if it's a small one for Manchester United. Joe, I mean, I, I, Joe, I'm sorry to interrupt, Greg, but I think my question about Martinez playing in the back is, if Maguire, he's made it fairly clear, has Eric Ten Hag, that Maguire is going to be captain still. Yeah. So who gets bumped? Is it, it's does Varane was, get bumped? It's got to be Varane, right? I mean, he's the only other player that be. would really be in, in position to start. I mean, you're going to see... Somebody not play. That's just how this works. If you spend this much money on Eric Ten Hag's guy in Lissandro Martinez, is is he not going to play? He's not going to play every minute, but surely he has to be a real important player for this team. And I'm not saying Varane's not going to play either, but if you are if you want to give Harry Maguire the captain's armband, which I, I, I do not think that Maguire is as good of a player as Rafael Varane, but if he's important to the squad in other ways, somebody's got to be a, a rotation player instead of a regular starter. And for me... You spend however much money they spent, $63 million on Lissandro Martinez under the current manager who's worked with that player before. It, it's got to be Martinez who's getting a, a big chunk of minutes in the back. For me, this, there's a lot of politicking going on with Harry Maguire. I think I think Ten Hag has been smart and has realized that if he comes in and says, Maguire isn't my captain, that pretty much signals that he's not going to be in the starting lineup it becomes very difficult to move him on but this this Martinez signing for me is the is the beginning of the end of Harry Maguire's Man United career because if Man United are going to play, play a high line and I've watched quite a bit of mine well I've watched their two games in, in pre-season so far mainly be, because they were on tv in the middle of the afternoon afternoon and it beat watching loose women which is a, a daily tv chat show in the UK not anything else by the way um sure. but, I was, I yeah, was very confused I think thank you for that clarification Graham <laughs> all right <laughs> yeah so I've watched both their games and Man United have played this this high line and I think Maguire's lack of pace is going to be a problem. In fact, Maguire didn't play the first preseason game against Liverpool, where United incidentally kept a clean sheet. He came in for the second game against Melbourne Victory, and within two minutes, he's been caught out by United's new high line that they're playing. So the reason that Maguire was still in the team before was that he was United's best ball-playing defender. Now that's Martinez. So in my opinion, I don't see how... I don't see what Maguire is bringing to the table if it's a partnership of Martinez and Maguire. I think Martinez and Varane make sense, obviously, if, if Varane is fit because he has the pace to make a, a high line work. I, I don't see where Maguire in the long term fits into this team now that, that Martinez has been signed. So maybe Maguire is going to start some games at the start of the season because I do think Ten Hag is wary of creating a, a big national headline which it would be if he was stripping Maguire of the of the captaincy but this time next year I'd be very surprised if Harry Maguire is a first team defender for Man United I would it wouldn't even surprise me if he is gone from Manchester United by this time next year Graham um having watched both the uh, preseason friendly games what is your opinion of this team at this moment uh, as we recalled they are uh, Eric Ten Hag's on an 8-1 aggregate victory uh, with those yeah. t- uh, two wins over Liverpool and Melbourne victory as you say um so that means therefore I should bet on them to win the league again right yeah, it worked out well for you last year. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's very early days and it's only pre-season and all the usual caveats and qualifications. And there is a lot of work for Ten Hag to do and I don't expect him to do it all in one season, never mind pre-season. But this, the team looks like exactly that, a, a, a team at the moment. So players look like they have an understanding of what their roles are and what they should be doing on the pitch, which seems like a very a very, a very base uh, requirement for a professional football team. But in Manchester United over the last few years, that has not been the case. I think they look a little bit fitter. They're pressing higher. There's a greater intensity to their play. These, these are all good things. And, and you can see, even with the early improvements that they have made, you can see that they lack technical ability. That's why Martinez has been signed. I think actually every single player that Mine have targeted this summer is designed to make them a more technical team, make them more comfortable on the ball. So Martinez is brilliant on the ball. Frankie de Jong, you can see why Ten Hag is desperate to sign Frankie de Jong because they need ball players in that midfield. They need players who can break lines, whether that's through a dribble or a pass. They need players who don't crumble as soon as an opponent even attempts a high press. And that is Frankie de Jong, Christian Eriksen, another really good te- technician. So you can see even in the performances that Mine are putting in, now they're lacking a lot and it's going to take some time but players like Scott McTominay and Fred and Anthony Marshall in particular who's become in the two games that I've watched a very different player than I am familiar with he's 
pressing high, he's forcing mistakes, he's been clinical in front of goal. Basically, everything you thought you knew about Martial as a player has been challenged if you've watched My United in preseason under Ten Hag. So I think My United are, are, are a very interesting case study at the moment because I think Ten Hag is challenging everything everything about that squad. I think players have been challenged in a new way that they've never been challenged in, in, in that way before. Um, but it, it is going to take time. So let's not get ahead of ourselves too quickly. Graham, so, I think- yeah, Joe... Sorry, I was just going to say to Joe, like this time last year, Joe, I did bet on Manchester United to win the league. And I'll have you know that several other people did predict first or second place for them. But just tell me they're going to finish sixth so I can keep the 10 bucks in my pocket. Does that make you feel better or or that other people also made that bet? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I think other we're... people were also stupid. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not the only stupid one, Joe. I think I think this team should be in the top six. Is that is that good enough? For, is that good enough for you? So sick. I mean, I'm not I'm not willing to to put them in the top three in this in this Premier League. I'm not willing yeah. probably to put them in the top four either. I think you're probably looking at fifth or sixth, and that is the reality. If Manchester United finish in fifth or sixth, that does not mean necessarily that this season is a failure. We should have realistic expectations for this team going in. If they're challenging for something more than that, then good on them. But I, I think it is important to be measured with this team right now. It's important to wait and, and really hopefully draw some meaningful conclusions after 10 or 12 games, we'll have a much better read on what this team is and who they are under Eric Ten Hag. But mm. yeah, Ryan, I, I think sixth would be a, a much better bet this year than first. Let's put it that way. Hmm. Sure. I can appreciate that. Tater, are you excited yeah. about Christian Eriksen? Uh, I am confused about Christian Eriksen. I think I'm excited for all of the, the narrative reasons. We know what, what happened with him at the Euros and for him to come back and have the, the season he had and the successes he had at Brentford. It feels like a, a very just like happy move for him to go to a theoretically still big club, uh, says the Manchester United fan. I wonder how he fits into this team a little bit more. I think that's maybe that's my wet blanket thinking because he's he's a player who, if Bruno weren't there, it would feel like, yeah, okay, they brought in this creative midfielder. I see everything that's happening. But with Bruno Fernandes still there, and we would assume Ten Hag is going to go with a midfield three, and maybe that's a 4-2-3-1, and then you only have the one number 10. Maybe it's that he'll use both of them when they're like uh, against maybe bunkered opposition you want two midfield creators in there so you could start them alongside each other but i i'm i'm sort of unclear why they went for christian erickson i and i feel like that sounds almost blasphemous with how good of a player he is but it's one of those where i'm excited about it and at the same time it's a little bit of a head scratcher for me and so i can't tell if that's just me being paranoid or uh if there is something to think about there so i ask uh graham and joe uh what their thoughts are or how christian erickson fits in or if maybe if i'm just being a little bit too neurotic which is always a possibility is <laughs> is he not just a very good depth option yep. is that not the, the thinking so I'm, I'm not convinced he will be in ten hag's strongest 11 but mm-hmm. he can play as a you know a number 10 as, as an eight he can play slightly at wide he even played in a deeper role for inter so i think in a lot of ways he fits ten hag's philosophy he's looking for as i say ball players players who can actually use a football to do things i know a novel idea for a manchester United player but ericsson just fits into a lot of different roles and covers them in a lot of different ways i noticed today ten hag was talking about how he feels he needs more than just a, a strong 11 particularly with the world cup this year so maybe that's that it's that sort of thinking that has led him to push for christian ericsson to be signed retweet <laughs> uh, then my other question for you, Graham, from watching them, do you see any signs that, that that they might deploy a back three, in which case you get Maguire, Varane, and, uh, and Martinez in there? Or do you see any indicators that Martinez might be uh, also an, an option at number six? He's done that with Ajax previously, but it does seem like he prefers to be a center back, prefers to stay in the defense. But I yeah. wonder if those are two wrinkles we might see. There hasn't been any sign of that in the two games that I mm. have watched. And I would be surprised if Martinez is going to play as the six. I, 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 when, when I first saw that sign and that was my initial reaction was, oh, he's going to be the holding midfielder. But then I went back and I, I found, I unearthed some Ten Hag quotes on how he thinks Martinez doesn't have the physicality to play in that position. So it would be strange if he's changed his mind on that in the space of a year. And it wasn't really until last season that Martinez actually started to to shine for Ajax. Before that, he he, I wouldn't say he was a flop, but he, there, there were people who expected more of him given the, the reputation he had when he went to Ajax. So there hasn't been sign of that in pre-season. What there has been sign of, particularly in the Liverpool game, was um, 
Eric Bailly, who played alongside Varane in that first game, he was he was pushing up into central midfield, and then that was leaving the the, the three defenders a lot more set a lot more central so he was he was almost doing the kind of Yao Cancelo thing I know Yao Cancelo as, as a fullback but same sort of principle where Baye was pushing up one which then allowed players like Fernandez and more attack-minded midfielders to push up one again yeah that's maybe wh- where I think Martinez is mm-hmm. going to play in this team where effectively he does end up in the center of that pitch area so that central midfield area but on paper he's still very much a center back that then raises raises questions about who's going to play in the fullback positions because if Luke Shaw and if, if it's Diogo Dallo at right back, can they play in a more central position? Is that going to work for them? But this is where I come back to this idea that there's a lot of work ahead of Ten Hag. It's not just about getting one or two players in. It's about how those players change the profile of, of the team as a whole. And it might be that Luke Shaw gets replaced for someone who can play slightly more comfortably in a central role in the next couple of years. But right now he can't do it all at once. So he's trying to get these these uh, key pieces in place and I do think Martinez will be one of those key pieces that that one center back pushing forward like like really forward into midfield was a theme from Ajax last season a lot of times it was Timber Martinez a center back partner who was doing the the actual really aggressive stepping into midfield to just play as sort of an auxiliary central midfielder in possession for brief stretches and so you had this almost 1-1 one, one shape in the back with one center back holding things back, maybe a fullback sucking back in, maybe both fullbacks are tucking back in, depending on what the specific situation calls for. We could see Martinez kind of flip the switch a little bit and, and have him be the one, like you're saying, Graham, to step forward and provide some extra numbers in that space. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how Ten Hag structures this team. I, I don't think he's the most important part of this team or, or he will be the most important part of their transformation if they are able to transform into a title contender again. But I think he will do some fun tactical things with Manchester United, and I am excited about that. All right, I think that's enough talk about a team that's going to finish sixth. Yeah. Oh, we're going to take a quick break. <laughs> when we come back, we're going to talk about Chelsea, Roma, and much more. Back shortly. Total Soccer Show, welcome back to our transfer spesh. Uh, let's talk about Chelsea. They've unveiled another player. They unveiled Kaladu Koulibaly on their US tour, uh, reportedly costing around £33 million. Graham, somebody finally got him. He seems like the player who every yeah. single Premier League window for since I was maybe three years old has been. Um, uh, he's been rumored to go to a certain club, and it's finally Chelsea who've got him. With you know Christensen and Rudiger going, excuse me, it seems like a good move for them. Someone with much needed experience coming into the back. Yeah, I honestly believed he was destined to become a Nico Gaetan or, or a Leandro Demao who never got that that big transfer because it seemed like he was, as you say there, Ryan, it seemed like he was linked with big clubs for about five, six years. And to be honest, the one time when I, I didn't expect him to get a move, it seemed like there wasn't all that much on the horizon. I know there were some links with Juventus, but this seemed to come out of the blue very quickly because when we did our transfer updates last week, I don't think Ch- Koulibaly and Chelsea were, I don't think they were two two parties that were being put together by, by many people, but it happened very quickly and all of a sudden he was he was posing in Vegas in front of the Bellagio Fountains in a Chelsea shirt, um, as Chelsea tweeted out over the weekend. But I am very excited to see him in the Premier League. He Not that he hasn't already played at a very high level, but I felt for two or three years that he's he's been ready for something new. He's physically strong um, so he's going to be that dominant that dominant centre back for Chelsea the Rudiger replacement did you know that his nickname at Napoli was K2 like the mountain Hmm. I think that tells you a lot about Hmm. how he's seen Um, but I I wouldn't say he's necessarily brilliant on the ball but he's not bad either and I think if Chelsea were to add Jules Koundé which it seems to be that seems to be their next defensive target because keep in mind they needed basically a whole new defence with Rudiger and uh, Andreas Christensen leaving and it seems like Azpilicueta might also be out the door to, to Barcelona so that's a whole new back back three so there's there's a lot of work for Chelsea to be done there it seems like Koundé is the guy they want now I think if they were to add him who is brilliant on the ball to a defence that includes Thiago Silva and Koulibaly that to me seems like a sensational defense where you have a lot of good quality spread across those three three players. And um, I think there's a good chance that Koulibaly now goes on and jo- joins the like of Van Dijk and Ruben Diaz as kind of being regarded as one of the best central defenders in the Premier League this season. Very good stuff. Uh, Joe, I'll, I'll, actually, no, Graham, I'll come back to you and pick up on something you said there about him maybe not being the best um, defender with the ball at his feet. Was he not linked to Man City dozens of times? So was Harry Maguire. 
is all I'll say Touché. to that. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> I, I think I think Koulibaly, I guess I'm a little higher on that than you are, Graham. I think Koulibaly is is good, very honestly very good with the ball at his feet. You think back to him playing under Sarri at Napoli, and he could do that just fine building from the back. I, I'm not saying he's flawless in that way, but I think he's a very well-rounded center back. And after his experience anchoring Napoli for so long, I think he is a pretty good fit in this Chelsea team. I think he can, he can do everything that Tuchel will ask of him. But we'll see. We'll see how this central defense and how this team ends up looking. You mentioned they're basically having to replace the entire central defense and even maybe some other spots along that back line. It's important for Chelsea to continue to build that out after Rudiger and, and Christensen are gone to Madrid and Barcelona, respectively. I get, I guess what I meant with with him not being the best in the ball, he's fine in possession, but I'm not anticip- anticipating him to do the Rudiger thing of really kind of driving through that central midfield. And that's where Kun- that's what Kunde does. So if they can get Kunde to add to that defence, I think that that kind of completes that defensive unit. I think he is a very, very good all-rounder, Koulibaly. I don't expect him to be caught out on the ball. I just, it just isn't the thing I would highlight as his absolute best quality. I think that's just his kind of dominance and, and uh, physicality. He is, he is K2, as mm-hmm. they call him. Indeed. Uh, Tater, is yeah. Koulibaly giving you the fizz? I mean, yeah, he, he honestly is. Uh, as a, like... Chelsea neutral, I guess. I would say that they're in the top four, if you're asking me for my rankings. Uh, And I think he is a big part of that. I think they've done some smart things for where they were when we weren't sure if Abramovich was going to sell or be allowed to sell, and they've had the kind of front office exodus they've had. Uh, Ryan, your introduction was perfect. A man named Todd came in, and not only has he let that a lot of the back line uh, move on on those frees, I think there will be more transfers outgoing, but Lukaku on the loan after bringing him in for over $100 million last year. Not a thing I would have uh, foreseen, expected, prophesized, wouldn't have expected Koulibaly to come in, would not have expected Raheem Sterling to come in. And yet, I think those signings, even if there is confusion about who will lead the line or how they will incorporate certain people or will they have to move on other players, cough, cough, Christian Pulisic, I think ultimately, at this point, I think Chelsea are in a stronger position than I expected them to be with all that uncertainty around them. I think they've figured some things out, and it could be Havertz through the middle. Uh, it could be Sterling on one side. It could be Pulisic on the other. It could be Mount in there. It could be Ziyech. We'll see if they move anybody else. But I think Chelsea have made two smart signings, and my assumption would be that we will see a few more before the window closes. I'm just keeping a mental note of the predictions we've made so far in this episode. That was Chelsea to be top four and Man United to be top six. I can't wait for our preseason predictions because they're going to be wild. And That's Bayern to probably uh, win the league. Oh, that was another one. That was yes, another one. Yes. Thank the you. Yeah, we, we, are, we are really reaching out there today. Congrats, everyone. I'm willing to say, I'm willing to say right um, now, Bayern Munich, top half of the table. I'll say that for sure. Boom. Barcelona as well, maybe top half of uh, the Liga. Well, let's, let's not see. get carried away. Right? <laughs> let's see. Yeah, let's bust see. by Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move it to Italy. Paolo Dybala has got himself a club finally, Taylor. He's going to Roma. Uh, an interesting one. Um, it's uh, I, I quite, I'm trying to figure out how he fits in there. I don't know if you've got any perspective, perspective on this, Taylor, because you have Zaniolo and Pellegrini playing sort of a supporting role for Tammy Abraham quite a lot of the time. Tammy doesn't always play a number nine himself. I'm trying to figure out where Dybala fits in this whole mm-hmm. master plan of he who yeah. has trophy tattoos. Here's, I will give you my like very uh, basic layman's explanation. And then I, t- I, I look forward to Graham uh, just dunking on me, but I, I'm going to go the lazy analysis route and say <laughs> that I think historically the criticism or analysis of Jose Mourinho as a manager has been that he organizes the defense. He gets everybody on the same page about how to defend, how to transition to defense and then how to transition to attack. But I, I think the old adage is that he lets the attackers attack. He lets them figure out how they want to play. And I think Dybala is a player who, similar to, who's the player? Uh, um, Ricky, Ricky Puj at Barcelona. We were talking about him last week. That I think Dybala wants kind of the creative freedom, the attacking freedom to play as he wants, to kind of pop up in spaces and, and not give be given a ton of specific assignments for where you need to be and how you need to play and how you need to play off of this player. And then you need to transition over here when you're in this way. I don't think that is necessarily what Dybala enjoys the most or allows him to thrive and so in that way I could see a scenario in which him going to Roma makes a lot of sense unleashes him a little bit more than we've seen in seasons past and fits in with Mourinho's stereotypical style Graham I turn it to you to as I said dunk all over that assertion 
No, I, th- I think that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I think the Jeez. Dybala signing is <laughs> if he can if he can form some sort of partnership with Tammy Abraham. I think this is the the thing that could push Roma into that top four this season, especially with Napoli likely to be weaker than they were last season. But it is going to require some uh, some squad surgery i think so mkhitaryan has has already gone and that makes it a little bit easier but they still have zaniola and i was just googling there to see if he had gone yet but he's actually still at roma there's a lot of speculation that juventus want him or inter want him and it wouldn't surprise me now that dybala is in the door that zan if zaniolo leaves because i feel like having the front two building around that front two of abraham and dybala and pushing pellegrini slightly back into the midfield and having the width from the full backs or the wing backs that that might work for Roma. And it's pretty similar to what Mourinho tried at Spurs, where he had obviously that Kane and, and Kane and Son partnership. So he has had some success with Taylor, as as you say there. He he tends to leave his attacking players to their own devices and relies on them having the instincts to know what to do at the right time. And so if he's creating space, I think D- Dybala and Abraham are players who can make the most of that space. Hello, Dybala liked one of my tweets once, Graham. <laughs> Mark Bosnich retweeted one of my tweets the other day. Who wins out of that contest, Ryan Bailey? Uh, we both lose because we both brought it up on a podcast. I think it's, uh, the answer there, <laughs> right. the correct one. Uh, let, <laughs> why don't we move on to talk about Toronto FC? Joe, they've been making uh, some signings. They've got another Italian on board, didn't they? They did. Toronto FC is just Italy, but in Canada. That's basically what we're working with at this point. They signed Federico Bernadeschi very recently, so it was officially announced at the end of last week. He's 28, and he's coming to MLS on a free transfer. That's kind of been Toronto's MO, snagging not one, not two, but three Italians in a very similar style, all very different players. Bernadeschi played about 1,700 minutes for Juve last year between Serie A and the UEFA Champions League. He's never been an every-game starter for Juve, but I can't shake the fact, and I want you guys to, to totally tear this down if you don't agree. I can't shake the fact that this is a, a pretty massive deal not just for Toronto, but for Major League Soccer. Mm-hmm. We're talking about a player here who's in his 20s, who played for Italy at the Euros. He played for them in World Cup qualifying. We don't need to talk about how that went. He played the last couple of seasons, <laughs> uh, the last five seasons, I believe, at Juve. And the last couple haven't been great statistically, but he put up some pretty promising numbers over his five seasons there. And any player who puts up promising or even good numbers at Juventus and is in their 20s is a huge get for Anybody in MLS, I don't think, and this is the part that I really want you guys to tell me if I'm wrong, I don't think an MLS team has ever signed a player from this level at this stage of his career. And so I'm going to toss out some criteria. They have to be coming from a major European league, they have to be an established national team player, and they have to be in their 20s. I I could not think of anyone that fit this upper tier of being in really all three of those categories. I thought about Chicharito, he was too old and doesn't even really have... He has a different, he's a totally different profile than Bernadeschi and is, is really well known for a, a number of different reasons. But I don't think he fits in this category mostly because of age. I, I was struggling to think of anyone else that fits into this category of a basically in their prime top tier international in terms of the team that they play for coming to MLS from Syria or another top European league. I don't think that's ever happened. And for me, Toronto FC deserve a ton of credit despite how dysfunctional they are and how terrible they've been on the field this season. They deserve so much credit for pushing the envelope and, and for trying to make deals like this to drag the rest of MLS along with them and say, hey, we're going to go out and spend this money. You guys can try to keep up with us or not. And at this point, everyone has more than kept up with them. Yeah. But I don't know what that'll look like a season or or a season and a half and a couple or two or three transfer windows from now. I think it's going to look a lot different. And 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 it's not just Toronto as well. So they ha- I don't think LAFC have signed anyone in their prime like Bernadeschi or maybe even... Uh, Insignia, but what LAFC as yeah, well sure. are doing is kind of dragging the rest of the league along with them. And I'm, um, I, I know there are some doubt on how, a doubt being cast on how LAFC in particular are getting around the salary cap and some of the <laughs> trade rules by having Chiellini and Bale and Vela and still having one DP spot free. But um, you know, let's just say that there is some, and I'm not saying they're breaking any rules, but let's just say there's some creative financing going on, right? We'll word it that way. That's just proof to me that. That to, to go off on a bit of a tangent, I'll keep this short. That's just proof to me that the cap and the league rules are now holding teams like LAFC and TFC back. I'm not saying L- MLS should have no rules, no restrictions, but surely it's now time to liberate yeah. some of these clubs a little bit. 
and allow them to, as you say there, Joe, about TFC, push the envelope a little bit because it feels like the will is there for the clubs to do that. Yeah. And they're having to find creative ways to get these guys in. Let's give them a little bit more leeway and a little bit more room to maneuver and that's just that's just my two and, cents in and this situation this toronto example is a is a perfect example graham toronto according to tom bogart are apparently looking for uh, a number nine as that third dp they already have io akinola who's a, a, a good player and they signed jesus jimenez uh, earlier this before the season started who's been pretty good for them as well imagine though if they didn't have to choose between signing a dp number nine to, to truly upgrade at that spot in actually solidifying the midfield or the back line, which I would argue are, are the two more meaningful areas that they should be targeting right now with that third spot. Imagine if they didn't have to choose which of those to target and they could actually build a squad with some sort of salary cap sure to keep MLS happy and to keep some sort of competitive balance in the league, but allowing them to better and more efficiently allocate resources across their squad. This has needed to happen for a long time. Paul and Sam talk about it seemingly every week on allocation disorder, and they did a really good job this most recent week of talking about the comments between Ernst Tanner and John Thorrington with the union and with LAFC respectively. It's a really good episode. Go back and listen to it. But it's becoming more and more clear that MLS is starting to outgrow its own roster rules. At least certain clubs in MLS are starting to do so. And I I hope we see at some point before I grow old and stop caring about soccer that we see MLS start to change because I want to see more signings like this in your prime Syria Italian national team Federico Bernadeschi involved in Major League Soccer. Yeah. Joe, I think uh, I would say I think uh, in talking about LAFC, would Carlos Vela uh, qualify as one of those players? Because I think he moved in his late twenties. Uh yeah, yeah, that feels about so, right. I mean, I think the I think the the criteria that I set fit for that. That's a really good one, Taylor. But I, I think even Insigne th- almost fits, doesn't he? He's too old. But yeah, he, he's basically, it's an arbitrary list well, of, no, of but criteria I think, that I made up, but I was trying to think about it in that way. And, but I think it really, I think even the Vela one emphasizes your point a little bit in my mind, because that was like, Carlos Vela is going to LAFC. It's this huge deal. He's going to be the man. He's the marquee name. And in this case, with your example, Bernardeschi is very clearly the second best player at TFC because Insigne will be the first. Sure. And so in that way, it feels even even like that level of innovative that the other player I could think of when it came to your criteria is Carlos Vela, who was like the marquee name for LAFC. And here it is Bernardeschi coming in, having the career he has had thus far, being as good as he is and being kind of the second fiddle at TFC behind Insigne. I think that is an yeah. unheralded thing in my mind. And it does feel like those are the moves you have to make if you want to jump back up into kind of like or into or near the top of the table, but also to remind everybody that you are a club that, that is good and can do big things. And I think Bob Bradley is uh, going to be feeling very opt- uh, optimistic about his team right now. Yeah. Wonderful stuff, gents. Let's wrap up the podcast with the tale of Dragon Skocic <laughs> at Iran. Um, so last Friday, Joe, he was, or well, last Monday, excuse me, he was fired from his job with the Iran national team. A little over five months before they play England on the opening day of the World Cup. Uh, Skocic guided Iran to first place in their group in both uh, the, uh, the group stages and the final stages to take Iran to their sixth World Cup. He won 15 of his 18 games in charge. Then something else happened, Joe. Yeah, so they they fired him, as you said, Ryan. And then just six days after firing Skokic Skokic as head coach, they re-signed him. So the Iranian Football Federation, a a spokesman from the IFF, announced on Sunday that the Croatian will, in fact, this is from the Associated Press, lead Iran into November's World Cup after all. So apparently the IFF had a board of directors meeting, and in that meeting they decided that they, they actually did want Dragon to stay around and to stay involved. Again, after they had fired him. So this was also after the IFF had voted as a federation to fire him. And now the board of directors are saying, no, he is actually going to lead this. And and this is a a big deal for Iran. They're going through a pretty tumultuous time in their federation. There's issues among the players. Mm -hmm. Uh, Taremi, who's maybe one of their most high-profile players in the attack, he hasn't been involved for stretches of Skokic's tenure because he and and Dragan don't see eye-to-eye. There are a lot of issues, deep-seated issues in the Federation right now. And I think this is another, just the latest, really, example of those issues coming up and actually impacting their day-to-day operations. As far as who's going to be coaching them at a World Cup, that starts, as you said, Ryan, in November. There are massive games coming up for this team, and it seems like they don't even really know who they want their coach to be. And at this point, who knows if Dragon's still going to be involved by the time November rolls around. It is a wild time right now as far as Iran, <laughs> yeah. Iranian soccer goes, at least on the men's national team side. It feels 
it feels unlikely to me that Skocic is going to be the manager at the World <laughs> Cup because I think they even went so far as to say, like, yes, he will continue as the manager for an indeterminate amount of time. Like, I'm not even sure they went with through the World Cup because I think they're electing a new president, right, Joe? Is that is that happening in August, I think I read? And so... I believe so, yeah. yes. And so then there's speculation that that new president, depending on the which way he's leaning, I think Carlos Quiroz is still in the conversation and could be brought back in depending on what the new president wants to do. So we might see even more instability before we have clarity uh, when it comes to Iran. But it does feel like there's a lot of chaos uh, across the board, and uh, I'm I'm very happy that we have the relative tranquility of the U.S. Soccer Federation to to kind of talk about over here. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's good news, I suppose, Taylor, for any other teams who are in their World Cup group, whoever they may be. Whoever they may be, indeed. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) sorry, Graham. (laughs) Sorry, Graham. I'm Graham. You're an honorary American. We've already done this. We're going to give you your first cap, and uh, in you come. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to paint my face. That a boy. There we go. I'm going to get you a hot dog and a, and a, and a Budweiser that's going to be really, really unsatisfying for you. And we'll paint your face and you'll be and a, a visor. Yeah. I guess. Is that an American thing? And khakis. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, is that something you associate with Americans? White, just visors? white New Balance yeah, trainers. Now you're just making yeah. now you're okay. just a dad. Yes, so that's an American right? a dad. <laughs> that's it. I mean, Graham is a dad, to be fair. True. So. Very true. We'll get him a riding yeah. mower. Yeah. Uh, C- concerns yep. about kids these days. Yeah, it all makes sense. Let's get Graham. Yeah, kids these days. Yep. <laughs> uh. Yeah, Graham went for visor over automatic weapon. Here we are. This is the. This is where we <laughs> yep. are. That's that's the kind of American we need. Graham, welcome to the team. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, Graham, welcome Thanks. to the team, and thank you for playing your part on this team on this here podcast. Thank you, Ryan Bailey. Taylor Rockwell, thank you very much, sir. R- thank you, Ryan Bailey. It was wonderful. Oh, wonderful to talk with you i almost have (laughs) lost the ability to talk but joe lowry thank you very much for talking to you too thank you ryan listener thank you for joining us we'll be back on the feed very shortly but for now bye